welcome to Criticalize Leadership with New Horizons podcast series. This is episode four. I'm Emma Carroll, Managing Editor for Critical Eye, and today I'm joined by our CEO, Matthew Blagg. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, Emma. How are you? I'm good. Are you looking forward to the Easter break? I'm very much looking forward to the Easter break. It's been a bit sunny and uh, the children are all excited and um, I think the Easter bunny's been. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I've got my parents coming around for the first time since June tomorrow. So I'm oh, well, that's, it's, to it's wonderful. The ability to get together is really exciting, isn't it? Definitely. Um, well, we're catching up after a run of great critical eye events. Uh, we had our uh, LED forum yesterday, our growth company forum, um, and also our Asia leadership forum, which is the one I hope that we could chat about today. If that's yeah. okay. um, I think there were loads of really interesting points that are uh, really useful from a global perspective for all businesses. Um, could we start with the big picture? Uh, at the forum, we conducted a poll and 87% of attendees said their leadership team needed to be more agile. Uh, my first thought was, um, since the pandemic, um, hybrid working is bringing globally distanced people closer together and that tech acceleration is giving them faster, cleaner data to make quick decisions. But from what you're seeing, are those things really helping them to make faster, better decisions? Well, I think in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. I, I think the virtual is extremely good for transactional execution, but it's not a, not so good for debate. And I think if you're talking decision making, there's a bit of both in there, isn't there? So, so once you've made a decision, executing it is faster virtually. I think the prepping to that decision is, is more difficult in a virtual world because you can't have so much debate. And so I think that does expose capability of leadership and the agility they have to make decisions and the culture that you have in your organization of empowerment behind those decisions. And I think in large complex matrixed organizations, I think it can be a barrier as bits of those matrix um, are sort of um, broken up in a more virtual world. I think it can slow things down. And I think that's why you're seeing um, the drive towards local decisions and trying to empower more. But then if you've got leadership that isn't used to that empowerment, that's quite a challenge. So I think we're in a fascinating time as we get into higher expectation of growth. Um, and then that agility and speed of decision making is going to become really important. OK, and you mentioned empowerment there. Uh, any sort of advice on how to empower, um, how to get those decisions made closer to the front line? Well, I think everyone, I think everyone generally buys into the concept of empowerment, but I think within that you've got to also buy into the concept of failure. And I'm not necessarily as sure that organisations are as, as um, prepared to fail as they need to be. And certainly if you look at high growth um, businesses, they, they fail fast. I think in larger organisations that's culturally more difficult. And so I think that balance is really important, sort of empowering people to be successful, but also empowering them to make mistakes where they're not penalised. And I think that's, that's really difficult to get right. Um, and obviously repetitive mistakes are, are um, career terminal. But that empowering through the organisations at all levels to be bold, to be brave, I think is really, really vital. I think that's true now societally. You know, at the end of the day, I think it's really important that leaders are bold and brave. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And what about operating at pace? Um, it, it sounds like something we should all be doing, but do you sometimes find that leaders sort of prioritise speed and turnover over profitability? What can they do about that? I think that the, 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 there isn't mutual um, individuality on these things. They, they technically can live together. Um, I think theoretically everyone thinks that pace and going fast is good, but it's not always. You know, if you're running in the wrong direction, you'll get further by then walking in the wrong direction. And um, so there is this sort of the tortoise and hare analogy of business will always live true. You know, very fast doesn't necessarily mean that you're going in the right direction. It's the ability to constantly assess that that I think is, is really important and, and reassess where, where you are. I think that the, the challenge you've got now is, is what your capability is to that pace. I, if you, have you got the, real, the people to execute at the pace you want in an environment where I think there's a lot going on underneath the surface for most, most um, organizations 
And I think that's the single question mark that you've got around um, things about what is that pace? What is the tension level that the organization can take? Typically, that's quite easy to assess in a business. I think right now that's brutally hard to assess. And the more geographical markets you're in, the more complex that question is because they're all in varying states of challenge. So, and I'll quote a um, regional CEO the other day, and his, his comment to me around um, the, the pace in his markets was absolutely linked to where the individual CEOs were in the countries in terms of how much how how well they performed through the last 12 months and how strong their culture was. And the stronger the culture was, the faster they were going now, where the gaps that have emerged, now they're going slowly and they're more exposed. And I think that's absolutely key. What you haven't got is the ability to drop into those markets still, because with international travel still limited, you've still got isolated teams. And I think that means you are only as good as the leadership capability in the unit. Okay, and so you're expecting quite a lot of churn in terms of the, uh, some of those roles once things open up a bit? I think you're seeing churn at all levels um, coming through from a board level. I think the same is true. I think that you'll see more chairman and non-executive change because again, I think the board boards have got to evolve as well. Um, I think you didn't see that coming into the CEO and, and the Exco team. And then that cascades down and um, you're seeing it in lots of levels. And, and I think that, that um, it, it's, it is a point when shareholders are expecting to see high performing organizations now. They'd be very supportive, but now the indicators both financial and non-financial are pretty clear and ultimately they're looking for leadership teams who can take the business to the next level. Okay thank you. What about um, strategy and having to change your strategy? We, we did another poll and 63% of um, attendees said that they'd uh, that COVID had forced them to change their strategy. Um, I was quite surprised uh, with the contrast with our HRD forum recently where only 34% said that. Uh, do you have any reflections on that? I think that the, my general view is that more than 63% have changed their strategy, but there is a definition of what you mean. If you're a retailer, you're still a retailer, but you might be more of an online retailer now than you were previously. So you can argue it's an execution component. Um, I think that, that um, at the board level, I think the, that recognition that where we're going to be in f five years time now is different to where it was going to be two years ago. Um, in some cases, because um, virtual movement has accelerated capability and service levels. Um, in others, because it's completely blown up the market. And, you know, retail would be a good example of that and accelerated the trends that were emerging. I, th I think that the, um, from a regional perspective, you've got a real cross section of geographical scenarios. And I think also that then links to the degree of strategic change that you've got. But I think that most strategies at the moment are fluid. I think they're still reactive. I think that you've got massive scenarios playing out. I don't think anyone knows what things look like in two years time because there's a big question hanging over everyone still of what happens with COVID post the, post the vaccines. Is it gonna come back round? And if it does, what, is, what are the implications? Okay, thank you. And do you have any advice in terms of having a flexible strategy? I think that my biggest advice for, for teams at the moment is to try and get together as much as you can. Mm. And um, I think there's been a massive lack of teams coming together. And I think that makes strategic debate difficult. And I think that good organisations have always got a degree of fluidity in their strategy. And um, it should always be reactive. You can never predict what's coming, coming down the pipe. Um, so you should have the ability to adjust. I think when you haven't, if you don't come together regularly, you haven't openly debated, it's more difficult to do that. And right now, globally, we've got a lot of leadership teams that haven't sat together for a long time. You know, I talked to um, CEO of a regional business just the other day who, who hasn't sat with his, his team for a year. And, you know, that's a long time to not have to And you discuss there's alignment and trust. It's all great. And then you discuss strategy and said, no, we haven't had a discussion around that. It's too difficult. So they're aligned as a group of individuals. They're aligned to, to 
trying to get through this. They're, they're fluid, but they're still really in survival mode. And I don't think that's healthy. And I think when you possibly can, coming together and having that open debate is just essential. Yeah, uh, I, I do agree. I, I wonder though whether there's anything we've actually gained um, from these new ways of working, from this remote uh, working for leadership teams, for boards, anything you're going to take away from it? I think, I think that, again, I think anyone who says they haven't been touched through this is, is um, uh, um, in a very weird scenario because it's impacted all of us as individuals and all organisations and societies as a whole. I think the reality of any significant change, it creates more positives than negatives over the long term. Um, and it, there's no question that's true. You know, the, the ability to, you know, if you take critical eyes scenario, we're mentoring people globally, you know, in a way we couldn't have done as easily before, you know, you've broken all the geographical boundaries. So in a lot of ways, it makes the world um, smaller. I think that you, what you really got to see that for the positives of, of when you've got the best of both. At the moment, you haven't. You've still got virtual and you haven't got in person. And I think when you blend those things together, you'll see the positives of both emerge. And I think that's where you'll also see the positive culturally for organisations. I think it's very difficult operating in a purely virtual world. OK, thank you. And you talked a little bit about alignment there. And obviously, with the global businesses, you've also got that, that, that sort of question of alignment between region and between uh, headquarters. Um, and I was thinking back to our past research, and quite often we had uh, local teams saying that they felt a lack of empowerment that didn't they enable them to act quickly. I guess going back to that, that agile discussion at the beginning, I'm wondering if you've seen that, that relationship shift during the pandemic. I think if you take the concept of, of Asia and you look at it from two different lenses, the, the sort of regional businesses of global um, MNCs, I think that, that in most cases the, there is tension now between the regional team and the global teams because, again, it's been a long period without having that close interaction and they're having to frame decisions on individuals that they wouldn't would have preferred to have done in a different way. And so most conversations, the stakeholder issues are, are growing um, and the, there is more tension. And obviously it depends how good your matrix structure is um, in terms of how that's working, but, but there's a huge amount of organization restructuring. And I think that's really difficult in this current environment when you're a, you know, you're a region I think that's true in any region of any global business right now. I think it's, there is more tension the further you go from the headquarters. I think that is why there's a drive to local. So I think that if, if you look at it um, regionally in Asia, there is more of a drive to in-country um, as opposed to more regional solutions. Um, you are seeing simplification, you know, pulling out of markets that you're not at scale out. And I think that's true in, again globally simplifying the business to mean it can go faster because essentially the more the simpler it is the more the technology can provide a greater solution the more complex it is it makes it much more difficult you need more leadership structures in there so i think it's a complex environment there's no question though that there remains a massive positive growth environment in asia obviously china's performed better than anyone else and that drives things underneath that though you've got some really good big questions that, that are going to be asked of businesses over the next 12 to 24 months. It's true. And I, I know a lot of the discussions we're having as well, where localism is coming up, um, depending where you are in the world. Is, is, are you seeing that play out in Asia as well? Is that feeding into what you're saying there? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, the, there's a really exciting bit around that. And I think that's been going on for some time anyway. So I don't think there's anything. And again, a great expression I had mentioned by a CEO to me yesterday, which is what, what you're seeing is the trends that were already going on accelerating, which I, I absolutely agree with. So I think that localization has been progressing for some time because it makes more sense. There's more cultural alignment, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge is, is whether, you, whether the leaders um, typically were much more supported than they are now. And so I think that's challenging um, organizations because you suddenly got more isolated local leaders. And I think that creates um, tension. So supporting them, making sure they have the right support structures, obviously where Critical Eye comes in, I think is hugely important. And 
I'll quote an, an Asian business that we're talking to where the CEO um, has got um, country heads who, who are now more empowered than ever be before because it would have been that the headquarters would, would have given them the strategy how to execute. Now the CEOs are devising and executing um, and um, there's much less control from the group and his recognition is that those leaders do need a lot of support to ensure that they can be successful in that environment. Okay, and, and what kind of form would that support take? What, what do you see? The well, CEO I think they doing? really need a number of things. They need reference points um, of people who have been through that before. Um, they, need to, they need benchmarking capability. And they need access outside of that local marketplace. Um, so that sort of global reach and being able to get access to people in different industries is really important because they're having to be more strategic um, than they ever were before. And that means you've got to have an awareness of the bigger picture. Okay. And you're uh, talking there a bit about benchmarking kind of on, on a personal leadership basis, as opposed to a sort of a business performance basis. I think on, I think on both, you know, if you take the, the um, different um, parameters, those country CEOs now are going to have to go and influence the board from, from virtual presentations They've got, they've got to be able to articulate probably three to five year returns. They, they weren't doing that before. They were managing the, the, uh, the position from the group. That's quite a significant change in the, in the expectation of the leaders. And that also puts pressure on them at a point when there's already quite a lot of pressure. So there's a recognition by group that it's the right thing to do. They're pretty well ready for it, but they are going to be very exposed and they are going to need that support. So clearly influencing skills are absolutely crucial in, in, in that role. Is there any other couple of skills you would say people moving from a smaller business to a large global business really need to focus in on and improve? Well, I think most, most things about leadership development are about what you leave behind. And um, often that's what people struggle with. So at the end of the day, as you get into larger, more responsible roles, you, you have to do less. And I think when you be more operational, that can be really difficult, especially in a crisis phase. So if you take right now, you know, where we've, where we've been probably through a crisis, it's really important the leaders actually get out of the engine room and lead. And um, I, think, I think for me, that's, that's really important. I slightly worry for the, um, the organizations where there's been this really open com communications platform, whereas actually I think the leaders now need to be more statesmanlike and they need to empower let people do it shouldn't all be about the leader um, they've got to make sure they've got the culture to um, to accelerate okay thank you and um, our next big um, event on the uh, critical eye calendar is our HRD retreat um, I was wondering what are the big challenges you're seeing HRDs facing at the moment anything you expect to come out loud and clear in at that, at that uh, session I think the HRDs are at the, the most interesting point probably they have been for years in terms of the next 12 to 24 months because the people agenda is going to be just incredibly complex because globally you've got varying degrees of COVID rippling through, varying degrees of vaccines, um, empowering people, what is the legal relationship with them, um, work workloads, pressure, mental health, it's not that the HR director is responsible for that, but, but ultimately they have a role to play in ensuring that, that everyone, everything's done to the best ability. And I think that it's an exciting time to be an HR director. I think it does require dynamism in the role. I think that um, my big advice to HR directors right now is to, is to lead and not follow and to ensure you're supporting the executive team and the board in that regard. Um, because I think if you do not do that, I think you'll have more people issues. Okay, and are there any uh, kind of attributes you, you think will be really valuable in terms of HRDs over the next year or so? Uh, any ones you expect to fall by the wayside, who do you think to be, will be successful? I think that, that um, you can argue that that's, this is true of all XK members, mm. I think the, the, the individuals who are um, seen to, to work with integrity, to be honest, to be clear, um, will be respected. And, and I think that within that, to articulate the problems and the challenges, I think that 
they can't be brushed underneath the, the table. And I think that's really important. And I think within the debate across the Exco, the HRD has a key role to align the executive team and the CEO. I mean, in a lot of ways, the, the HRD is the right hand person of the CEO to execute and to ensure that the people strategy is aligned to the strategy. And so that alignment piece of, between the two is so very, very important. And I think that making sure that, that you have a strong cultural fit is essential. Okay, thank you. Um, I, at our um, NED forum yesterday as well, we, we asked uh, the non-execs um, who they thought would be most influential other than the CEO in terms of transformation over the last 12 months, uh, sorry, over the next 12 months. And um, the HRD came out top. Uh, and, and I agree with you. I think that reflects the conversations I'm having with CEOs and CFOs as well. They're all talking about collaborating with their HRD a lot more. Um, do you see the HRD becoming more important in the business? Is this a permanent shift, do you think? I, I think that an XK member is an XK member and there should be an equality in there. And so in that sense, there shouldn't be any difference between today or yesterday. I think then it's about the skills around that table. And there's no question that the people agenda is the, the front and centre of that. But to be honest with you, the people agenda should be as strong with all members of the Exco. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that it's a mistake to, uh, to articulate that it's the HR director who represents that. I think that the positive from an HR director role, you are just going to be involved in more things and there's going to be more complexity. And as such, you, you've got a stronger remit. And within that is what you do with it. And so... I think it's an opportunity for HR directors to lean up and to really influence at, at the board level, as opposed to being in the operational execution phase. And I think that, that making sure they've got a voice is vitally important. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. I really enjoyed that conversation. It's always really good to catch up on these sessions. It's a pleasure. It's been great. Thank you.